our next section in 1 Samuel. And uh, tonight's message really uh, delves into some amazing faith on the part of a man named Jonathan. Uh, but the object of his faith is pretty amazing too, the Lord himself. And so we have amazing faith and amazing grace tonight. Now, we begin, we pick up the story in verse 15 of 1 Samuel 13. And there we read, Then Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people present with him, about 600 men. Saul, Jonathan his son, and the people present, present rather with them remained in Gibeah of Benjamin. But the Philistines encamped in Michmash. Then raiders came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned onto the road to Ophrah, to the land of Shual. Another company turned to the road to Beth Horan. And another company turned to the road of the border that overlooks the valley of Zeboim toward the wilderness. So basically what we have up to this point in the story is Samuel leaves the presence of the king in Gilgal, uh, which is the easternmost point on our map here. So if we're getting our bearings, uh, we're looking at Gilgal, which is over here. And these, these uh, lines all represent something on the map as well. So Michmash, this is going to be the central area of where uh, the Philistines and their army have encamped. And the green lines, as you follow them along, these are the lines that denote where the raiders uh, headed. So you have that first party that is moving north up to uh, the northernmost point in the map, Ophra. And then you have another raiding party that heads toward the east in uh, Beth Haran. And then you have another party that's heading toward where Saul is. And this is the Valley of Zeboim that the passage is talking about. So this gets our bearings. Now if you're wondering, this map is really zoomed in and it has to be so that we can see. Uh, but to get your bearings, this is where Jerusalem is right here. So all of this is happening a little bit north of the city of Jerusalem. So Samuel has left the presence of the king and uh, things are not going as well as we'd like them to. He's going where Jonathan is, which is kind of a prescient thought when you really think about it. He's going to go where Jonathan is, and uh, Saul is going to be left alone. And Saul seems to be far away from what is happening, but he's going to start to move in toward the battle, and everything is going to really be keyed in on that area of Michmash. Except for when we move on in the story, Saul is going to be close, but he's going to be under a pomegranate tree, and he's not, he's not really capitalizing or taking the initiative. It's going to be his son who does that. But we don't know exactly why, so we can't really cast judgment upon Saul, at least not at this point. And so you might be wondering, well, why, why all of this detail about these raiding parties? And I think that it's to make God's glory all the more brighter in the situation. I, I think that the author just continues to pile on this idea that things just seem impossible at this point and there, there doesn't seem to be any way out. Uh, I think if you talk to anyone that was in the military, the raiders resemble maybe people like the seals or the rangers or people that will go in uh, to particular areas and they will upset supply la lines, they will go ahead and they will burn and, and do everything that they can to hamper any kind of uh, fight that the enemy would put up against them. So take care of supplies, burn, burn food, uh, especially in a culture like this, get rid of crops, everything that they can do to make it a lot harder on the enemy. So when we get to the end of this section, we're really seeing a very bleak uh, picture before us, but it only gets bleaker as we continue on in the story. Look at verse 19 in our text. Now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords or spears. But all the Israelites would go down to the Philistines to sharpen each man's plowshare, his mattock, his axe, and his sickle. I think I had mentioned this detail last week, but here it is in, in the text. 
And the charge for a sharpening was a pim for the plowshares, the mattocks, the forks, and the axes, and to set the points of the goads. So it came about on the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan, but they were found with Saul and Jonathan, his son. So Saul and Jonathan have the only swords that are available. This is really something, when, when uh, first reading through the text and studying it uh, weeks ago, one of the things that occurred to me is this kind of resembles what's happening with North Korea and the United States and probably every other ally we have. We're doing everything that we can to keep um, North Korea or Iran from developing nuclear technology and missiles, right? Why are we doing that? Well, because these people are crazy, all right? Why would we want weapons in the hands of uh, these people? They don't they, they, they would use them in, in such a way that, that would uh, devastate the world. And so we do everything to keep them out of the hands of these dictators or these crazy, wacko religious people in Iran. So the weapons here are not nuclear. But, you know, it's relative to the time. These people do not have blacksmiths. They're removed from Israel kind of re reminds me of this idea of going after <laughs> the physicists and the nuclear people in Iran, right? Uh, we, I'm sure we do things with our military where uh, we try to undercut these people, kidnap them, take them out of the country, upset the, the nuclear uh, situation in these countries because we want to protect ourselves and protect, and protect Western Europe too, by the way. So uh, I, I see a, a parallel here. Uh, they're taking them into Philistine territory. Uh, there's this monopoly, not really on the idea of iron. That's not the monopoly. It's not that they can't get iron. The Israelites can get iron. But it's the monopoly on the skill of taking the iron and then making it into a sword, making it into a weapon. They didn't have that technology. They didn't have the ability, for whatever reason, to process the iron and to make sure they used it to wield it as a weapon. So Israel might have to resort to using agricultural tools. It kind of reminds me of Transylvania and going after Dracula, you know, with all of the hoes and the different things uh, that the people have, that the townspeople have, because they don't have weapons. And so that's not a problem for God, right? Because if you just go back in the book of Judges, and I think maybe Josh preached a message on Shamgar, they could take a goat. And they can, they can wreak havoc with a goat. I mean, how many men did Shamgar kill? Wasn't it 600? So the idea here is something can be done. All you need is the Lord. He can use a goad that is normally used to prod oxen to kill 600 Philistines. That's not a problem for him. Nothing is a problem when it comes to the Lord. And as a matter of fact, we're going to read when we get into 1 Samuel 17 about a young boy named David. And what does he need? Not great technology to take down the giant, who is well armored, by the way, even his armor bearer is well armored, all right? Not, not great technology, just a stone, one stone and a sling, and that's all. And that's the end of Goliath. So the Philistines, they do have superior strategy here in the text. They have the high ground, they have weapon technology. I mean, anybody that's looking at the story up to this point. Uh, they're going to say, if they don't know the end of the story, they're going to say there's no chance. Israel has no chance and, uh, and there's no way that they're going to be able to defeat this foe. But don't forget this great lesson that we know. With, with God, all things are possible. Now, back to the map here. In verse 23 it says, And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the pass of Michmash. Now it happened one day that Jonathan the son of Saul said to the young man who bore his armor, come let us go over to the Philistines garrison that is on the other side. But he didn't tell his father. Saul was sitting in the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in my ground. The people who were with him were about 600 men. Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, was wearing an ephod. But the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. 
between the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison. There was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other side and the name of the one was Bozaz and the name of the other Sina. Front of one faced northward opposite Michmash and the other southward opposite Gibeah. So if you go and you look at verse 23 here in, in chapter 3, it, it gives us a setting again for the main army of the Philistines, that centralized city of Michmash where the blue flag is on, on the map here. And there's great tension. And while Saul is sitting under the pomegranate tree, Jonathan takes the initiative. And Saul has moved. He's moved toward the battlefield or, or the theater. So he's come from Gilgal and he is here on Migran. And this is where he is at this point. But Jonathan is over here in Gibeah and this is the direction that he is heading. Sina is right here on one side of the green uh, line where Paul, remember Saul is right here. Jonathan is moving this direction. And so you've got Sina here and then on the other side of the path you have Bozes and Jonathan is moving through this area. And it just seems to me that he's moving through that area because the area is giving him cover of some sort as he heads toward McMash. But he's also heading up. Okay, we know this from the story. We know it from the fact that he, the Philistines have the high ground. And so it just seems impossible what he's about to do. So maintaining the element of surprise and moving in the way uh, that he, he desired as far as the initiative, he brings his armor bearer along. Now, this is kind of a, a, a strange thing, but armor bearer in a battle would not be carrying armor. I mean, I hope we understand that because if he's carrying your armor into battle, that's not going to go well for you. Okay, so he, you've got your armor on. The armor bearer was more like a weapons bearer. He carried extra weapons for the warrior. And so the, the warrior is wearing the armor, he has his own weapons, and then uh, the armor bearer might have backup armor, he might have some weapons to give uh, to the warrior if, if the warrior should need it. Uh, or he might be like Jonathan's uh, weapons bearer, a man that will come alongside Jonathan and behind Jonathan and kind of mop things up as Jonathan heads forward. But it's kind of interesting in the battle, as we read about the battle that Jonathan goes through, ask yourself the question, is Jonathan doing the killing here? Is the armor bearer doing the killing? Or maybe the Lord. Maybe the Lord is doing the killing here. It's kind of an interesting uh, take on the text. So here he's, he's moving. He's got the spare, the spare spear or maybe the, the sword or some kind of weapon, a mattock, a pim, or not a pim, a, a goad. A pim is what you use to get the goad sharpened. Uh, but they're trying to move forward and do what God has led them to do. Now when we get to verses 2 and 3 in chapter 14, Jonathan's setting is here before us so that we know exactly what Saul is doing. I mean, to see what Jonathan is doing, to see what Saul is doing in the text helps us to develop a contrast. I mean, if we really think about it and, and we, we give it some meditation, we see the contrast before us. One man sitting, another man acting. And Saul's availing himself of maybe the access that he has a little bit later in the chapter. There's no denying that. We'll see that in the later part of chapter 14. But still, he's not moving right away. We switch back to Jonathan in verse 4. And his movement is very detailed, moving through the rocks that we spoke of. And this leads us now to verse 6. Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. So his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Go then. Here I am with you, according to your heart. Then Jonathan said, Very well, let us cross over to these men, and we will show ourselves to them. If they say thus to us, wait until we come to you. Then we will stand still in our place and not go up to them. 
But if they say thus, come up to us, then we will go up. For the Lord has delivered them into our hand, and this will be a sign to us. Well, I'd have a hard time with that if I were the armor bearer. Okay, come up. Come up to the slaughter. Come up to the high ground. Okay, anybody that knows anything about uh, military battles, if you got the high ground, you, you've got it won. And so, to, especially in a battle like this, so to come up, it just seems uh, very foolish that he would do something like this. But remember, we're talking about faith. Saul, and we mentioned this last week, treated the Lord like he was a genie. Give me what I want. I rub the lamp. You give me what I want. That's a contrast with Jonathan. Because Jonathan is not treating God like a genie. Jonathan is acting. He's moving forward. And the reason why he's moving forward and doing what he's doing, it says in the text, these uncircumcised, these strangers, these people who are aliens to the covenant, they've invaded our home and they serve as an affront to the Lord himself. And I'm not going to have this. That's his whole mindset. This sounds very David-like to me. This is why they were probably good friends. Jonathan does not have access to a priest. He doesn't have the ability to sacrifice like Saul did. And yet, he is moving forward. He believed that God would make his will known providentially in this sign that he floated out here. And for people who say uh, that anybody who asks for a sign lacks faith, uh, they really don't know what they're talking about. Right? Because the idea of him acting in the way that he was going to act, I mean, this is a big step. And asking God for some confirmation when we're weak, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I, I don't believe that there is. I remember Pastor Mincy used to tell the story uh, about asking God uh, to bring rain uh, as in, on a day when it hardly ever, in a period of time where it never rains in Northern California, to, to help him to know whether or not, I can't remember what it was for, whether he should stay here to plant a church and, and teach at the seminary back in the 70s. I think that was the, the thing. He didn't know what to do. He was willing to do it. He asked God for that sign. God gave him that sign. It rained. I don't have a problem with that, and I would never dare say that the Lord didn't do that for him. And yet we have people who think that they're smarter <laughs> and wiser. And, and they are, usually are pretty sanctimonious. Oh, I would never ask for a sign like that. Kind of reminds me of Ahaz in Isaiah chapter 7. Oh, I don't need a sign. <laughs> well, I'll give you a sign. <laughs> the Lord himself shall give you a sign. And so the idea here <clears throat> is along that line. So I think Jonathan was a courageous man and he's asking for a sign and the sign is given because God loves him. So Jonathan believed that once the sign is given, the Lord's going to give us the battle. Uh, he's going to give us the victory. I'm going to put one foot in front of the other. I'm going to follow through. I'm going to do what God has told me to do. And his words in verse 6 are worth pondering. Nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few because he was certainly outnumbered. And everything was going against him. But he understood how big God was. I think that's our problem. Our problem is we get our eyes fixed on the, the difficulties around us and they seem insurmountable. But when we take our eyes and we lift them up to the Lord, all of these things seem so small. And God is very big. And that's the way that we need it. That's the way we should have it. Actually, sometimes the Lord will reduce the number of combatants on the field in order to show that he is to be glorified and that he is the one that gives the victory. Another great element in this passage is the weapons bearer and his response to the commander. Isn't that a great thought that he has there in verse 7? Do all that is in your heart. Go then. Here I am with you according to your heart. I mean, this man was ready to die for his master. He, he understood. I, I, I'm, you know, what would he say today if, if, if this was a modern battle? What he would say is, you go right on ahead and I'll be right there for, with you keeping an eye on your six, right? I'm going to make sure that uh, you are protected and I'm going to be there with you even if it's to the death. So basically, Jonathan would not engage the Philistines at the end of this passage where we've read up to this point unless they invited him to the high ground which was occupied. And it all just seems very crazy to us. 
And yet, even though it seems baffling, the Lord put that in his warrior's heart for his own glory. So, verse 11. Both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden. And we talked about that last week, remember? They were hiding in caves and rocks and thickets, anywhere that they could find in order to get out of the way there. So now one has come out of the hole. Then the men of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come up to us and we will show you something. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, I don't know about these words, but this is some faith right here and courage. Come up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. Well, it just doesn't seem that way to me. And, verse 13, Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees. Okay, not, not a very uh, good way to go, right? Um, so he's going up on it. Not, not much going on as far as being able to, to wield a sword. So he climbs up on his hands and knees with his armor bearer after him. And look what it says. They fell before Jonathan. They fell before Jonathan. And as he came after him, his armor bearer killed them. That first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within about half an acre of land. And there was trembling in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. The garrison and the raiders also trembled, and the earth quaked so that it was a very great trembling. So basically, what we have here is Jonathan eliciting the mockery of the Philistines. And they lumped Jonathan and his armor bearer into the same category of the men who were hiding. The men who had no courage and no faith at all. But they didn't know who they were messing with. And so their overconfidence and this superiority of thinking that they had, this pride that they had as they taunt him. And, and even the words here, we will show you something. I, I think the idea there seems to be, we're going to teach you a lesson that you'll never forget. This really is a worthy prelude to David and Goliath and to what happens in that story. So Jonathan has heard all that he needs to hear. He goes up the ridge. He has confidence that the Lord gives to him to deliver him. And as he ascends, they descend. He strikes them down right and left, however it's happening here. But it seems that the Lord is enabling this situation. It's supernatural. And as they fall, the armor bearer just comes along and these men are prone. There's nothing that they can do and he finishes the job by killing them. I mean, Jonathan doesn't even have to get his hands dirty except for the crawl up the mountain, you know. Uh, God is doing a great thing here. His power is working. And both men do to the enemy, which seems impossible to us. So what about all of that weaponry? What about all that battle skill? What about all that strategy and military advantage? Well, without God, those things don't matter at all. 20 enemy combatants are killed in a very short distance. When it says a half acre of land here, it's not a half acre as we understand a half acre. For the Bible measurement here would be uh, an area that oxen would plow in about half a day. That's the idea. And so Jonathan's bravery and the Lord's power are affecting the Philistine army because it says in the text that those in the camp and those raiding and those on the field, they all tremble in fear. And so this is the Lord's doing. He strikes terror in the hearts of his enemies. And he's caused the earth itself to tremble as well. So that leads us to verse 16. Now the watchmen of Saul and Gibeah of Benjamin looked. And there was, remember we left Saul under a pomegranate tree. And there was the multitude melting away, and they were here and there. Then Saul said to the people who were with him, Now call the roll, and see who has gone from us. When they had called the roll, surprisingly, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. Remember, he didn't tell his father, the text says. And Saul said to Ahijah, Ahijah rather, Bring the ark of God here. For at that time, the ark of God was with the children of Israel. Now it happened while Saul talked to the priest that the noise, so Saul's trying to get advice from God through the intermediary of the priest. Now it happened as Saul talked to the priest that the noise which was in the camp of the Philistines continued to increase. So Paul said, or Saul rather said to the priest, withdraw your hand, stop doing this. I mean, he's all over the map. 
Stop doing this. Verse 20, then Saul and all the people who were with him assembled and they went to the battle and indeed every man's sword was against his neighbor and there was a very great confusion. Moreover, the Hebrews who were with the Philistines before that time, who went up with them into the camp from the surrounding country, they also joined the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, all the men of Israel who had hidden in the mountains of Ephraim, when they heard that the Philistines fled, they also followed hard after them in the battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle shifted to beth Aven. So Saul has the initiative, but he doesn't respond immediately. And it seems very godly and very wise what he's doing. I'm going to get communication from the Lord. I'm going to ask the priest. But then he breaks off contact with the Lord and stops looking to the Lord for help. He's confused by what's happening. He's asking the Lord to help in, in one instant, in the other instant. He's confused and rattled by what he's hearing and by what's going on around him. He tries to abort this attempt. The priest withdraws his hand. Apparently, I think that we see some erratic behavior, some panic. Why would he panic? Well, the enemy's panicking. The field is erupting. For him, he doesn't know what's going on. And so it's all very difficult. And yet the power of the Lord is going to deliver Israel this day. And while some weakness in Saul may be exposed here, and perhaps not, I don't know, it just depends on how much you want to give to Saul in the story. One thing's for sure, nothing can stop the Lord from blessing his people this day and giving them the victory. Not even inept leadership. Nothing can stop the Lord and what he is planning to do. So let me just finish with this. How do we see uh, this story wrap up and, and, and how can we use it in our own lives? Well, we can key in on the amazing faith of Jonathan. It's very easy to do because we always look at Bible, Bible heroes and we say to ourselves, wow, this is amazing what they have done. I would never be able to do something like this. But I don't think that's what the Lord wants us to do when we read stories like this. I mean, it's hard not to admire a man like Jonathan. And when we look at him, we say to ourselves, well, I'd really like to have a friend like that, a spiritual man like that. But the Lord gave them what what they needed at the time and the Lord was the one that instilled within Jonathan the courage that he needed as far as the people what did they want well they wanted a king remember this is how the whole ball of wax gets started they want a king so they don't let up until they get a king and the Lord gives them what they wanted and this is the great danger in all of our lives that the Lord would give us what we want instead of what we need I mean he did that here would anything stop him from doing it now? I mean, we want it, we want it, we want it. And then the Lord says, fine, you want it? Just like the quail. Well, I'll give it to you until it's coming out of your nostrils. I'll give it to you. And so this, this seems to be the idea here too. The Philistines really had their, their you know, their, their boot, we could use modern terminology, on the neck of, uh, on the neck of Israel. And so that, that comes across. They are very intimidating. Israel's trembling. But when we leave the story at this point, it's not Israel that trembles, but the Philistines that tremble. And yet before all of that great reversal takes place, it's Jonathan who believed that the Lord, who could, he's the one that could do it. And so Jonathan put his faith in the amazing grace of the Lord. Against all of the backdrop of unbelief and it is very very uh, very bleak indeed there's Jonathan amazing faith to what God is going to accomplish so how does this amazing grace of the Lord work itself out well, in three ways the Lord works through weakness the Lord works uh, through the idea of hope giving confidence to his people and the Lord uh, assures them that he will bring them the victory well, he works the same way in our lives, too. And we could find this mirrored in the New Testament. In other words, the Lord works through our weakness. When we first started studying what Jonathan was facing, I mean, if we didn't know the end of the story, and so many of us know the end of the story, we say to ourselves, this is pathetic. It's hard to think of a worse situation. But that's the point. That's how God wants us to conclude. 
He wants us to see how pathetic it is. And he works through our weakness. When, when the Lord sees that our power is gone, that there's not one ounce of strength remaining in us, that's when he comes in and he rescues us. It's been true in my life. I'm sure all of you could uh, share testimonies uh, of times when all hope is lost and you felt the love and the compassion of God in your life and you knew he went to work for you, defending you and helping you. He reduces even our resources to get us to the place where we need to be. This kind of reminds me of Gideon. Well, you have uh, a lot of men, Gideon, 32,000 strong. How about I whittle that down to 300? I mean, this was the man who was afraid to thresh grain out in the open. Okay? And now he has this strong force, but God is saying, I'm going to bring it down to 300. I want the glory. I'm going to give you the victory. You're going to learn that lesson. So God makes the impossible possible. The first thing that we need to understand when we're facing difficult circumstances in life is that God will work through our weakness. Secondly, the Lord bolsters our confidence through hope. What, what did Jonathan know about the Lord? Well, Jonathan knew who the Lord was and what the Lord could do, and he believed that God would do it. He believed that the Lord might work for him. That's what it says in the text. That's first what he believed. I believe that God could work for us. Now, the, the language doesn't seem that settled to us. Well, who knows? The Lord may work. Well, that's the only option he has. If the Lord doesn't work, then so be it. It reminds me of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel. Well, throw us into the furnace. If we, if we die, we die. But who knows? The Lord may work and we won't die. And that's sure enough, that's exactly what happened. And that's what happens here too. God can do a great thing and we must never stop believing that. Now the second aspect of the language here that, that shows us that he had hope is found when he says that he believed that the Lord could save by many or by few. We don't have the numbers. We don't have the strategic setting. We don't have the weaponry, but it doesn't matter. With God, he can do anything. And so we call to mind all the promises of God and we put our hope in him. We bank on those promises. That's what we were singing about tonight. God can do things that are inaccessible to us. We can't ever stop believing that. Okay, we don't have to depend on ourselves or on our own resources or, or on, you know, technology or whatever it happens to be we are on having money in the bank or whatever we trust that the Lord will take care of us he can do what is impossible and I have hope in that and then that leads us to the final point the Lord assures us that faith in him always brings us the victory every single time Jonathan understood that those who trust in the Lord will never be disappointed as with the writer of Hebrews we ask, what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of those, and I won't list all of those that he mentions, but to tell of those who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Escaped the edge of the sword. Kind of reminds me of Jonathan in his situation. Out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, Jonathan. Turn to flight the armies of the aliens. Hebrews 11, verses 20, 32 through 34. If such amazing faith is, is in front of us, we need to understand the fact that faith is only as good as the object. And so his faith was in God and God's greatness, God's grace, God's mercy, God's power. Everything is of God. And that's what's truly amazing here. I mean, is it the faith of Jonathan that we should really be looking at today? Because that faith could be just as small as a grain of mustard seed because that's the way Joshua was, a very timid soul. And yet God gave him victory after victory after victory so that he subdued the land. Can we believe that God will do great things right now today as he's done great things in the past? That's the question that we're facing. Really amazing faith that needs to be just a very small thing, a blip on our radar. It's God that we need to keep our eyes on. And that's what this text is teaching us. If you have just small faith 
in such a great God. It really doesn't matter as far as the degree of your faith is concerned. What matters is that God can take that small bit of faith and enable you to move mountains, to have them be removed and be cast into the midst of the sea. That's what God can do. And he can do it today. He can do it at any point. There's nothing that hinders him from acting. Yes, the God of peace, according to Romans 16 and verse 20, will crush Satan under your feet. That's what the text says. And so, you fear the future? Well, God has given help. He's given us help in the past. He'll give us help in the present. And he'll give us help in the future. God is the same. He has never changed. And so we need to be strengthened in faith, according to Romans 4 and verse 20, giving glory to God. We need to be fully convinced that what God has promised, He is able to perform. And if we trust in that fact, that's what will be accounted to us for righteousness, just as it was for Abraham, really the father of faith. Amazing faith, yes, but an amazing God who gives amazing grace. Let's pray together.